Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the McGuire Woods COVID-19 Employment Webinar Series Legal Guardrails, Guidelines, and Developments. Today, our topic is paid FMLA and sick leave under the new Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FICRA. My name is Brian Barger, and joining me is my fellow labor and employment partner, Peter Farley. Thanks to everyone for Good afternoon, in. everyone. Before we get underway, let me mention a few housekeeping items and then we'll get started. On your webinar screen, you should see several widgets towards the bottom. Let me call your attention to a couple in particular. First, the green meeting material widget includes a copy of the presentation itself. A link to those materials will also be sent to you separately via email, which you can use yourself or share with others. Second, you will also see a purple Q&A feature. Please use this to submit any questions you have throughout the webinar. We'll be leaving all questions to the end of the program, and we'll do our best to get to what we can. However, uh, for any questions that we don't have time to cover, we'll follow up with you individually after the program is over. Uh, please also note that this presentation is being recorded. We will circulate a link to the recording together with the webinar deck and an evaluation form after the presentation is ended. We'd graciously appreciate it if you can complete that evaluation as it certainly helps us improve all our offerings. In addition, for all attorneys who are attending, CLE credit is in process for approval and we will apply the credit to the BARD number submitted when you originally registered. If, like me, uh, you have questions about that, or if you didn't provide your bar number to us during registration, please contact Laura Pickert at our firm at 804-775-7578 or at lpickert at mcguirewoods.com. Her contact information is also contained in the webinar evite sent to you earlier. So that's it for the housekeeping instructions. Now on to the Family First Act itself. So I have to say, when looking ahead uh, back at the beginning of March, this was not exactly the March madness that I personally had in mind. Uh, I'll say on the negative side, uh, after having won my firm's March madness bracket for the first time ever in 2019, I am sad that I won't have a chance to repeat for the 2020 bracket. Uh, however, on the positive side, uh, since, frankly, I'm a double who UVA grad, both undergrad and law, to me, this really means that Virginia will be reigning champs again for 2020. So go hoots. Uh, I'll have to say the rest of what we have to cover today is not nearly as fun as that, uh, but it's far more important. Uh, so let's get started uh, with a quick overview of the law itself uh, and a discussion about who is covered. What we plan to cover in general is an overview of the FICRA requirements with respect to both paid sick leave and paid FMLA leave. We're going to talk about the interrelation uh, of the new act to current leave that's already on the books, namely regular high test FMLA. We're going to just do a brief discussion about the tax credit and IRS guidance that go along with FICRA that should hopefully help employers pay for these new obligations. And then we'll try and cover some questions at the end. So, the act itself, <clears throat> what does it generally provide? And we're going to get into the details of this uh, uh, as we go along. But just to give you a very high-level overview, there are two main components, at least on the employee side, under FICRA. There is a paid sick leave statute, a bucket, uh, in that act, and there is a separate paid family in leave, medical leave bucket. Uh, the paid sick leave portion of the act has six separate triggering events which Peter will go over. Uh, and it's helpful to keep in mind that that part, the new federal, federal emergency paid sick leave component, is a brand new federal statute. There are no pre-existing regulations that go along with it. There are no pre-existing legal structure in which it, it embeds. That's different than the paid family and medical leave provisions under FICRA. Under those provisions, it only has one triggering event, which we'll discuss, and technically, it's an amendment of the already existing Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, and that's important in a number of respects, uh, which we'll discuss as we go along, because there already exists a current federal regulatory structure to provide some limited guidance 
separate from new regulations that will be coming out. Uh, it's also helpful uh, in, to the extent that there are case law uh, provisions and prior interpretive guidance that can maybe provide some enlightenment as we sort of uh, wind our way through the new act. It's also important to keep in mind that when you're thinking about the statutes themselves, uh, I've been trying to tell clients, keep, these are leave statutes at their core. The, the emphasis on paid leave, paid FMLA leave, uh, they are not unemployment statutes. And as we'll discuss later in the Q&A section, perhaps, and in other areas, uh, this is important because technically, as we read the act, uh, if you are able to work uh, uh, in, some, in most circumstances, or the flip side, if you're unable to work, but the inability is not because of one of the triggering events, but it's because of business closure or layoff uh, or termination, then in some circumstances, this act may not apply to you. Uh, again, the, the purpose of the act is to provide paid leave, not unemployment. There are separate parts of FICRA, separate parts of other bills that are pending that provide unemployment relief. This is not an unemployment statute. Uh, we'll figure that out more, hopefully, when regulations come out. And this is just a caveat for everything that Peter and I are going to say. Frankly, uh, what we're telling you today is our best guess sitting here at 1.07 uh, Eastern Time on the 24th. This may all change, uh, or a good bit of it may change, depending on what the final regulations say when the DOL issues them, hopefully later this week or next week. The other thing I will say is, as we speak, uh, the Senate and House have been taking up a brand new act, the Take Responsibility for Workers and Families Act, uh, which, believe it or not, further amended parts of what we're about to talk about here today. Uh, we're going to cover that briefly later on uh, in this topic. Uh, hopefully, things will be hashed out uh, by the time this is all over. Uh, but uh, this is just a short way to give you a heads up to say what we're covering again today is as what exists today. This may all change in pieces or parts, uh, depending on when we wake up tomorrow. So, uh, with that, currently sitting here today, who's covered? Uh, well, with respect to employers, uh, it covers private employers, both the sick leave portion and the family leave portion of the new act. It covers private employers with fewer than 500 employees, and it covers certain public employers regardless of size, whether you have one employee or a 1,000. Uh, <clears throat> presently, who are not covered? <clears throat> private employers with 500 or more employees, basically big companies. And there's a possible exception, uh, depending on the final regulation. Small businesses with fewer than 50 employees may be exempted from the act if the lead requirements would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. What that means, uh, how that would be certified, uh, we'll have to see in the regulation. Whether that's actually in the final regulation, we'll have to see in the final regulation. But at least right now, that's what the current statute provides. Um, so how is the 500 count, to me, how is the 500 employee threshold actually counted? Uh, I will say that we're getting a lot of questions about that. So we'll do our best to try and answer that here. First of all, the 500 includes full-time and part-time employees both. Not independent contractors, but actual honest-to-God, high-test, full-time or part-time employees. Uh, but you need to be careful about this. Who is and is not an employee versus an independent contractor is a subject of high debate, especially in some states like California. You need to pay attention to that for your applicable jurisdiction. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, when do you look at that 500 employee count? Well, again, there's no regulations uh, on this. Our best guess is it's going to be 500 as of the time of the relief request after FICRA is in effect. Uh, what we do know is it's unlikely uh, that they're going to use the FMLA look back period. And what I mean by that is if you actually look at the current FMLA regular regs, uh, when you're trying to figure out whether the 50 employee count applies, the regulations say that you're supposed to look at the number of employees, quote, for each working day during each of 20 or more calendar work weeks in the current or preceding calendar year. There's actually sort of a look back clause. There is no look back clause, as we can tell, in the new act. And so it's probably going to be at the time of the request period. Uh, 
The other question we're getting a fair amount of is, well, what about separate legal entities? Do they get rolled into the 500 count itself? That's a great question. Uh, and again, there are no regulations on this, but we think since this is largely based on current FMLA and FLSA regulations, it's likely that the DOL is going to adopt uh, that same test used under those statutes. And those statutes currently employ a joint employer and an integrated employer test. On the integrated employer side, that mostly deals with parents and sub entities. Uh, and right now that test generally provides that when looking at whether you're integrated for purposes of account, DOL will look at a four part test, the degree of common management, the interrelationship between operations, uh, the de degree of centralized control of labor relations, and the degree of common ownership and financial control. In other words, how integrated are you? Do you use the same HR functions? Do you use the same management teams? Do you share employees? Do you share payroll functions? Do you share accounting functions? Do you share other sort of ownership degrees? The, the more plugged in you are, the more integrated you are as an organization, in theory, you're going to be covered uh, together collectively for purposes of the 500 count. There are, of course, exceptions to this, and we're happy to talk about that one-off uh, with you later on to the extent you have questions. Uh, but we, our best guess sitting here today is that's how the count is going to be determined. As for employees, uh, which employees are covered? Well, it depends on the statute. Uh, under the sick leave proponents, or excuse me, the sick leave section of FICRA, it covers all full-time and part-time employees. There is no waiting period. So as of the effective date, as of the requested leave, if you're a part-time or full-time employee, technically you are covered. For the FICRA FEMLA leave or family medical leave, it's different. It covers all full-time and part-time employees who have been employed for 30 or more calendar days. So it's not everyone instantly. You have to then have been on the payroll for at least 30 or more calendar days. Note that this is different than the standard FMLA rule. The standard FMLA rule is that you have to have been employed for at least a minimum of 12 months prior to requesting leave uh, and have worked at least 1,250 hours and be working at a site that has at least 50 or more employees in a 75 mile radius. That is not the test for FICRA emergency FMLA leave, uh, but it does remain the test for regular FMLA leave, which Peter will talk about later. Uh, as for who else is covered, there is an optional exemption, and it, currently the Act says that employers of healthcare providers and emergency responders may elect to exclude such employees from the operation of both the sick leave and the FMLA leave portions of the Act. Uh, I will note that, that sounds really broad, but it probably is not. Uh, we'll see what the regulations say when they come out. Uh, but keep in mind, this does not say that employers of healthcare providers and emergency responders get to exclude all of their employees. It says that employers and healthcare providers and emergency responders get to ex exclude those employees, i.e., the providers themselves, the emergency responders themselves. Uh, and right now, if we had to guess, they will probably follow the FMLA definition of healthcare provider, which is a pretty limited set. So uh, the way we read it currently, and we'll have to see what the final regulations say, but the way we read it, that means if uh, I am a doctor, for example, of a big healthcare system, and I want to be, uh, and I'm the employer of that doctor, and I want to exclude the doctors uh, that are working for me under FICRA, I can probably do that. Uh, can I exclude the, the records assistant uh, who helps process the bills for that doctor? Hmm, not so sure about that. As I currently read it, the answer to that would be no. Uh, but again, we'll need to see what the final regulations say. Speaking of which, uh, next we're gonna talk about sort of what are the triggers themselves. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. Peter? Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks for everyone for joining um, today. We know this is a, a very uh, challenging time, so we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all about this new law. Um, as we transition now to the sick leave and the specific qualifying reasons, um, really want to start with the, 
the initial the initial uh, point there on the slide unable to work or telework due to need for leave because the employee and then there are <clears throat> six reasons that qualify quarantine which is a federal state or local quarantine or isolation order self quarantine and symptoms and diagnosis um, we've already had some questions about what if an employee is diagnosed um, would they be eligible for sick leave and we believe the answer to that is yes because that person would be subject to a quarantine but note the statute doesn't expressly say that we would expect the regulations to address that um, self-quarantine is pretty self-explanatory the local health care provider has has that and um, and symptoms and diagnosis is more vague. What what does it exactly mean if you have symptoms or di or have or are seeking a medical diagnosis related to COVID-19? Um, before moving on to the next slide, I'll just note these are areas where you know it will be appropriate for employers to ask employees uh, about the reason for the qualifying leave and and perfectly acceptable to take to make reasonable inquiries with respect to doing so. Um, the other three qualifying reasons for the sick leave is care for a quarantined or self-quarantined individual, um, child care, and substantially similar condition. Um, the care for a quarantined or self-quarantined individual is really the same if you're trying to take care of someone who is in that predicament. And similar to how regular FMLA caring for someone who is ill or suffering from a serious medical condition. The child care uh, provision of the sick leave is for someone whose child is um, at home because school is closed or their daycare or other care provider is unavailable. A lot of folks are experiencing this across the country, so we expect this piece of the sick leave law to be um, invoked by employees uh, pretty immediately once the act goes into the into effect and you may have already received questions about that we'll get into a little bit more detail in a in a little while the substantially similar condition means the person is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions as specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services this is the employee's own condition not to care for others how far and what substantially similar really means will be fleshed out in the regs, we hope, uh, and to get some additional guidance. Um, and so stay, uh, stay tuned to our, our updates on that. Feel free to reach out to us um, if you have questions regarding how that gets flushed out. But that's essentially, uh, those are the six ways you can get sick leave under the new federal statute. For the family medical leave portions, and remember, as Brian mentioned, this is an amendment to the Family Medical and Leave Act. This one is more limited. It's unable to work or telework due to the need to leave for leave because uh, the employee has to care for a child. It's the same, same reason as the fifth item for the sick leave. The child is home from school because school is closed or their care facilities closed or their care provider is unavailable for whatever reasons and cannot provide that care. Um, please note that this FMLA piece under the new statute does not apply to the other reasons that you can take sick leave, but that doesn't mean that an employee who may be eligible for regular FMLA may not be able to access that leave under your applicable FMLA policies to, um, to have job protected leave because of quarantine or illness or care for someone who's, who's sick. It won't necessarily go as far as um, caring for someone who's not suffered from a serious medical condition or caring for that person as the regular FMLA applies. But we just point out here that, that while the family medical leave is limited to child care, regular family medical leave may still be applicable depending on the employee's particular circumstances. 
So next, next let's talk about the leave amount. First, we're going to cover the non-child care leave amount. So this is sick leave only, applies to the reasons one through four and six. So everything except the child care and the family medical leave is not applicable to this. All right. So this is this is purely just the sick leave piece of it. You have up to 80 hours for full-time employees eligible leave to take. Part-time employees, you look at the number of hours that the employee works on an average over a two-week period. So we, we think that the best way this will be interpreted is the equivalent of two weeks of hours, depending on how that part-time employee works. For full-time employees, this is likely going to be just straight eight-hour days or calculated as such. Um, but there could be shift differentials. There could be people working additional hours. And the, it is important to keep in mind that this statute is, is uh, structured as a matter of hours of leave, not days of leave or weeks of leave, like you may be used to under um, intermittent FMLA leave. So just keep in mind that this, this leave is specifically related to 80 hours for full-time or the number of hours an employee works on an average over two-week period for part-time employees. For the child care piece, the sick leave and the FMLA leave both apply. So if you just think back, the sick leave is 80 hours. But if it's child care, you have sick leave plus the family medical leave uh, 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 that's provided under the new statute. Full employee, full-time employees get 12 weeks of leave at 40 hours per week. And part-time employees up to, tw up to 12 weeks of leave at the number of hours that they normally are scheduled to work over that 12-week period. So you'll have to keep in mind those calculations as you're determining the amount of the leave for uh, child care uh, and also how that fits with the sick leave provisions that also apply to caring for child care. And we're going to talk in a little bit about how these leaves work together and what we expect employees to do and to seek in connection with, uh, in particular, the child care provisions of this. So I'm going to turn this back over to Brian to cover the payment amounts. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, and so, as you know, Peter just went over sort of how much time do you get, and, and we're talking about leave itself. When do you get to go out? And how is that calculated? That's separate from how much pay you get under the Act when you take that leave. And I will say this is the more complex portion of the Act. It's complex because how much pay you get will depend in part on the trigger uh, that you fall under with respect to paid sick leave or paid FMLA leave under FICRA. So we're going to try and summarize it here. I will commend to you, too, the Department of Labor itself actually put up a short summary over the weekend that describes this in some uh, short detail. Obviously, the regulations will flesh this out further, but it's not a bad summary from a starting point. So separate from our materials themselves, the DOL has a fairly good summary of this. Uh, let me see if I can walk you through it. So let's start with non-child care related leave. Basically, uh, sick leave uh, triggers that Peter covered items one through three, specifically meaning I'm quarantined myself, uh, I'm self-quarantined, uh, or I personally have symptoms of COVID-19 and a pending diagnosis. I haven't been quarantined or ordered because I haven't been confirmed, but I'm waiting to figure that out. Uh, if those are the circumstances uh, that under FICRA, I get full pay under the sick leave portion at the regular rate of pay that uh, Peter just mentioned, uh, or it's at the applicable FLSA minimum wage rate or state or local minimum wage, whichever is greater. Now, for the most part, that's not you're never going to have an issue with that. But for some lower paid workers, uh, and depending on the nature of the state you're in, some of which may have higher uh, minimum wage requirements, uh, this 
this alternative clause might be triggered. But for the most part, you get your full pay, you get it at your regular rate, but there's a cap. Uh, you only get up to $511 per day, at least under the federal pay provisions, and $5,110 in the aggregate over a two-week period. Uh, you might ask yourself, why is there a cap? Uh, there's a cap because the government has limited amounts of money in their treasury to reimburse for this, which we'll talk about later, and they don't want to be re reimbursing but so much money. Uh, so the way it works, at least for the first three clauses, quarantine, self-quarantine, or I personally have symptoms and are waiting a diagnosis, I get full pay uh, if it's triggered, but up to only a certain point, 511 or 5,110 over that two-week period. For the other non-child care reasons, items number four and six, it's different. Uh, and the way to think about this is it, if it's to care for an individual who's either quarantined or self-quarantined, or I myself have a, quote, substantially similar condition. Uh, under those scenarios, I don't get full pay. I get two-thirds pay uh, at the regular rate of pay or the minimum wage, whichever is greater. And the cap is different. The cap is not $500 per day uh, and 5110 in the aggregate. The cap is $200 and 2000 in the aggregate over a two-week period. I will say, however, that we'll have to see what the final regs say. The thing that's a little bit odd, to me at least, is the second part, the employee's substantially similar condition, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Originally, uh, items four and six were supposed to be for care of individuals, uh, care for somebody who's self-quarantined, and care for an employee's substantially similar condition. They modified that in the final bill, and the substantially similar condition is not for care, but because you have it itself. So as a conceptual matter, from a policy standpoint, it doesn't make any sense to me that if I have COVID-19, I get full pay. Or if I'm self-quarantining, et cetera, but because of COVID-19 myself, I get full pay. But if I don't have COVID-19, but I have, quote, a substantially similar condition, I only get two-thirds pay. Uh, it's odd. Uh, so we'll see if the DOL fixes that in the final regulations, but at least right now, that's what it says. Uh, that then flows us into, okay, what about child care? And this is probably the most confusing part because, again, child care falls in two buckets. All the other triggers do not, but child care both implicates the sick leave portions of the FICRA and the family and medical leave portions of FICRA. Uh, and so this only applies for if you're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable. Keep in mind, uh, I think Peter may have mentioned this, but if not, I'll say it here. Uh, child care provider is a defined term currently under the FMLA. We'll have to see what they say in the final regulations, but as we understand it, that's individuals who are receiving compensation for child care. That does not mean uh, your Aunt Susan who, or Aunt Fred who may be taking care of their child on a volunteer basis. Uh, technically, that would not count. Uh, uh, but what, what do you get for this? Well, you get two-thirds pay, uh, not full pay, again, at the regular rate of pay or the minimum wage, whichever is greater. Uh, we think that's how it's going to work. Again, a drafting anomaly, this part about the wage at the regular rate versus the minimum wage was definitely included in the sick leave portions. Uh, that sort of toggle point was not included technically in the statute for the FMLA portions, uh, and so we'll have to see whether that was just an anomaly or whether they actually make that a real distinction in the final regs. Uh, but what else do you get? Well, you have that same threshold, up to $200 per day, just like what we mentioned before, except the total aggregate is more because the weeks that you're allowed to take are more. So it's up to $200 per day and up to $12,000 in the aggregate. So conceptually, this is how it would work. If I'm out because of child care, I fall within the two different buckets, both sick leave and FMLA. As we understand it, they would both run concurrent. So just like now under FMLA, you can start paid leave and FMLA concurrent at the same time, two different stopwatches. 
They both click together. They start running together. The first two weeks of the FMLA portion by statute, by the new statute, is technically unpaid. But that gap is filled by the first two weeks of the paid sick leave. Uh, so what that basically does is you've got 12 weeks that starts from the very beginning for FMLA. The first two weeks get picked up by the, quote, paid sick leave portion, and the remaining 10 weeks of FMLA gets picked up by the FMLA portion. Conceptually, it really makes no difference in the end because overall, everybody still receives two-thirds pay. It just comes technically out of different pieces and parts. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Peter to talk about how all this interrelates to regular leave and some other nuances. Peter? Thanks, Brian. So as you all can see, there are some other rules that are provided for in the statute that, um, as we're saying it in becoming more of a broken record, the regulations will, will likely flush some of this out. Um, I'll note we have not seen any specific indications of the depth of those regulations or, you know, whether they're expected, um, you know, a few days before this goes into effect on April 2nd. Um, but we are we are optimistic that we'll see at least some guidance from the Department of Labor on this. So um, the first thing here, just to keep in mind, there's no carryover of sick leave from year to year. This uh, this law is currently set to sunset, but that could change depending on economic conditions and political discussions, obviously. So right now, there's no carryover to be worried about. There's also no required cash out of this un, any accrued but unused sick leave. Um, so if you have policies for other PTO that you pay out on termination, an unused sick leave um, portion that you will be following will not have to uh, be paid out upon separation. Um, the next bullet point is one of the most important ones that I think we need to keep in mind, which is Employees can use sick leave first before they use any other available paid leave, regardless of the kind of paid leave that you may provide. Um, but employers cannot require someone to use other available paid leave first. So the, the choice is the employee, and that person can decide whether they want to access any other leave or not and um, or they can use uh, the sick leave first and save that for later when um, they may want to take a vacation or have another personal need for paid time off. It's going to be very important um, as you implement this leave in your workforces that you remind um, you know fellow HR professionals and what have you to be careful not to try to um, push employees to take other required leave first um, so that, that this provision you can ensure compliance with and will avoid claims or concerns that, you know, an employee was forced or coerced or otherwise pressured to take other sick leave before taking this new FICRA sick leave. Um, on the FMLA piece of the new law, employees may elect to use other available leave to cover unpaid portion of that FMLA leave. Remember, the first piece of it is unpaid. So just like with typical FMLA, they could take vacation, PTO, et cetera. But again, just like with the sick leave, there is not a requirement that you can't require employees to use other paid leave first. That is a difference from the regular FMLA uh, statute, which permits it. So, again, with the FMLA piece, as with the sick leave piece, we employees can voluntarily choose to, to elect a, uh, using another kind of paid leave if they want to, or they can save it. And um, if they are... Uh, uh, if they have uh, the ability to access that other leave later, they can save it for other purposes. 
apart from what was uh, sought under the FMLA or the sick leave portion. Um, I would note the example we provided in the in the slide. Um, you know, using PTO to cover the other third of an employee's regular pay during the 12 week period, that's possible. So you can see how there could be some ways that employees may try to use their paid leave if they so choose to help make up some of the shortfall in pay um, that they may be experiencing as a result of the caps that Brian talked about with respect to how the, the leave works. Um, there will likely be some creative ways to try to use these leaves together and to um, and to uh, maximize the paid time off for, with other policies that you may have. So we, we anticipate these, the, these issues will present some complex questions and um, we, we hope that it not only through you know, guidance from the secretary but also this practical uh, implementation of it, these issues will become clearer, but um, please keep in mind how these various leaves work together and how they will work with your existing uh, leaves and policies. Um, other rules with respect to the FMLA piece of FICRA, there is job restoration protection. So, Employees must generally be returned to the same or an equivalent position um, as they had prior to leaving. There is a fewer than 25 employee exception um, that will apply if the position is eliminated due to the pandemic and the employer makes reasonable efforts to restore the employee. And if the efforts fail and you notify the affected employee if an equivalent position later becomes available during the defined contact period. So keep that in mind. That conflicts with and modifies the FMLA provision that says no greater right to reinstatement clause. So keep that in mind as that gets flushed out with how these uh, this leave and the restoration issues get get uh, further detailed. Yeah, Peter, this is with Brian. respect to the, uh, Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to add, the reason we mentioned that is it's a little baffling why they had to include that provision at all. Because if you think about it, if your position is eliminated due to the pandemic, not because I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not only, I can't go out and leave because I just simply don't have a job, right? Then under the normal FMLA leave, the normal FMLA leave would say, well, look, you know, the FMLA does not give you super priority over all other events. If you had been fired ordinarily, if you would have been riffed ordinarily, regardless of the leave, then you don't suddenly suddenly get, get to continue to take leave. So in theory, they didn't really need to add this in here. So why it's added and then why it's limited to only 25 employees in this circumstance is, is a little bit of a head scratcher. And we'll have to see what the final regulation said. Yeah, that's a very good point, and and um, we may even see some adjustment to this in the new uh, law that is being debated today that Brian's going to touch on a little bit later towards the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, we'll just have to monitor how these things get get uh, adjusted and and flushed out as we go forward. Then just um, on this slide, we you know we just wanted to reiterate. Um, and clarify for everyone there, that normal FMLA that you have obligations to comply with is still there. Um, and it's still available for employees to take uh, in addition to the sick leave and the new FICRA FMLA leave. Um, I would point out here that non-child care leave is not covered by the FICRA paid FMLA provisions, so quarantine, self-quarantine, symptoms, diagnosis, et cetera, but it is likely covered by regular unpaid FMLA. As I mentioned earlier, if you are diagnosed with this illness or you're caring for someone with di that has been diagnosed with this illness, that's going to be a serious medical condition that's going to entitle the person to FMLA, regular FMLA leave which is covered by the same rules that um, are in effect today. Employers with 50 or more employees 
Employees employed 12 months, worked 1,250 hours at a site with 50 or more within a 75-mile radius. The regular rules will apply. So uh, just keep in mind as folks are asking questions about access to leave, should they have a serious medical condition or caring for someone with such a condition, um, you want to first think about the FMLA and the um, sick leave piece together and then see how the availability of that leave may apply to their particular situation. Um, that's, it won't be that they can use the new FMLA for non-child care, but they may have sick leave and then they may be able to take regular FMLA should they need you know, that additional time to do so. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Brian to go over the tax credits. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I know this is really important to folks, and, and we're going to continue to keep an eye on this, as I'm sure you will as well. So what I'm telling you is what we think the tax credits will work as sitting here today. Luckily, IRS uh, put out some guidance on this over the weekend. We have a link to that on these materials, which you can take a look at. Uh, I thought that guidance was just, uh, particularly helpful uh, and quick. Uh, and they also promise, frankly, that they'll be issuing additional guidance uh, later this week. So there's probably more to come on this. But here's sort of how we think it's currently set to work. Right now, uh, so you're obligated from a cash flow standpoint to pay all this money that you weren't expecting back at the beginning of March. How are you going to do it, especially if your operations are thin to begin with? Well, uh, the way it's designed to work, is we're supposed to get a dollar for dollar reimbursement tax credit for all qualifying wages paid under FICRA up to the applicable per diem and aggregate payment cap. So you can't just pay anything, uh, but you'll get a dollar for dollar credit up to the applicable caps. And the way it works, according to the IRS, and this is helpful, it applies not only to the tax remittance itself, which you have to pay, but you might be able to get a refundable sort of advance uh, uh, where the credit actually exceeds what you owe, which we'll talk about in a second. So it's positive. It's not just necessarily a credit, but you might actually be able to get a little bit more. Uh, the other good thing about the IRS guidance, and frankly, I wasn't expecting to see this based on the statute, but it's in the guidance. They said that it's also going to apply from a tax credit standpoint to the extent amounts paid or incurred uh, also relate to maintaining health insurance coverage. How that's going to be calculated uh, and how you get credit on that, uh, again, based on the current payment structure, is unclear. But supposedly, there's going to be more regulations and guidance on that soon. So that's positive. It's actually more than just uh, the leave itself that might extend to health insurance. Uh, so uh, here are a couple things from the IRS notice itself. Uh, the IRS on the notice that got issued on March the 20th indicated that under guidance that will be released next week, eligible employers who pay qualifying sick or child care leave will be able to retain an amount of payroll taxes equal to the amount of qualifying sick and child care leave that they paid rather than deposit them with the IRS. Basically, you keep the money. Uh, and they say, well, what kind of money do I get to keep? Well, they say the payroll taxes uh, that are available for retention include withheld federal income taxes, employee share of Social Security and medical Medicare taxes, and the employer share of Social Security and Medicare taxes. So it's not like it's not ever going to be owed. You're going to have to pay it up eventually. But at least up front, from a timing standpoint, you will not have to submit it initially. You get to retain it. Uh, the notice also goes on to say, to take immediate advantage of the paid leave credits, businesses can retain and access funds that they would have otherwise paid, based on what I just described. But they can also, and this is important, uh, if those amounts are not sufficient to cover the cost of paid leave, employers can seek an expedited advance from the IRS by submitting a streamlined claim form that will be released next week. That form is not out yet, uh, and how that works is not clear. But basically, you can do more than just retain. You can get some expedited monetary relief. So they gave a couple of examples in their notice. Example number one, the IRS said if an eligible employer paid $5,000 in sick leave, 
and is otherwise required to deposit 8,000 in payroll taxes for their quarter, including taxes withheld from all its employees. The employer could use up to $5,000 of the 8,000 in taxes it was going to deposit for making qualified leave payments. Basically, you get to keep that. The employer would only be required under the law to deposit the remaining 3,000 on the next regular deposit date. So you retain it, which is possible. Uh, they also give another example, and this has to do with the expedited request. They say, well, for example, number two, if an eligible employer paid $10,000 in sick leave and it was normally required to deposit 8,000 in taxes, basically you paid out more than you have for tax, the employer could use the entire 8,000 of the taxes in order to make a qualified leave payment, and they could file a request for an accelerated credit for the remaining 2,000. Again, how that accelerated credit's gonna work, uh, how fast you're going to get it, uh, how that's going to sort of be applicable is unclear. But again, it's more than just an offset. It looks like you can get it in advance uh, in some circumstances, all of which I think is pretty positive. Peter, you want to talk yeah, about we, some we other were, open issues? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I was going to say on the taxes, we, we were encouraged by this notice um, that because there was a lot of question as to how employers who were going to have um, you know, significant cash flow issues as this um, pandemic wears on and the shutdown orders that many of you and shelter in place orders that many of you uh, have been experiencing across the country impacted revenue, um, how you were also going to be able to afford uh, effectively providing this new paid uh, sick leave and paid family medical leave. So, this, at least from what the IRS has, has issued, and all indications are that um, there, there won't be material changes to this, at least right now, that they're going to put in place, you know, a good, quick, and efficient way for employers to be able to retain uh, funds related to the leave to help with that, both providing that leave and help with their own uh, cash flow. So very, uh, very unique approach by the IRS, certainly reflects the uh, situation that we're in. And um, as, as Brian indicated, we'll, we'll see more regulations from them about this, but I expect they'll just uh, further elaborate and detail how this will work. So we hope this, um, this will be a, at least a positive aspect to this new uh, paid sick leave uh, law that's that's um, going into effect April 2nd that'll enable companies to you know get through some of at least partially get through some of the difficulty that the law uh, imposes. Um, this slide really just um, highlights some open issues that we have identified pending the regulations that are expected um, soon. So the final effective date not later than 15 days after enactment. We believe that's April 2nd at the latest. Is it going to be before April 2nd? Um, you know, who knows? Uh, I, I would say it's probably unlikely, but it could depend on the new bill that's being um, uh, debated by Congress today and whether that somehow gets pushed forward in light of the stimulus package and other things that are are being contemplated by the federal government. So um, we are planning and telling clients it, it, we believe it'll be April 2nd, but it could be sooner, so just be mindful of that. Um, how to address qualifying events that began before the effective date. So an employee has a qualifying event, the leave has not yet gone into effect. Let's say they're quarantined. Um, and uh, or caring for someone who's quarantined or what have you. Um, what, what, how does an employee get access to leave that is um, not available yet by law, but they are out? And we'll, we'll, we expect that there'll be regulations, you know, explaining this. Um, but right now, based on questions that we've seen from clients, um, the leave will be effective if the person is qualifying as of the effective date. So they won't be able to say, well, I had leave, a qualifying event before the law went into effect. Now I'm back, 
and I get paid leave for that period of time before, I think the safe answer is no. If they're out now, the law goes into effect and they contact you and say, I'd like to access paid leave now, then they would you would have to consider that request at that point from that from going forward. Um, it is clearly unsure what these shelter in place notices may mean for purposes of this leave statute. I don't believe that most of them, uh, and we've been tracking them, say that a shelter in place qualifies as a quarantine or an isolation order, but they are they have language in them uh, that indicate you know words to that effect. And so far, quarantine or isolation orders or, or, or activities have really been related to someone who's been diagnosed or someone who's been exposed to someone who's been diagnosed or someone who is showing the symptoms of COVID-19, cough, shortness of breath, fever, et cetera. So we will have to see how that these orders uh, impact um, the leave laws, and you know they are being issued uh, very quickly and are uh, as different as all of the 50 states. Some of them are following uh, a pretty general pattern, but then they have additional provisions that that talk about what is essential or businesses that are supporting essential businesses and how those restrictions apply to employees. And so. It'll be important to keep in mind um, the the limitations uh, there and what what whether these orders actually would trigger leave. We also uh, we note that you know to what extent leave stacking would be allowed with other state or local paid leave or FMLA leave laws. Um, as Brian mentioned, it, it's certainly foreseeable and likely that employees will take the sick leave and the FMLA leave concurrently for the care of a child. That would just make sense, and they, they would likely do that to try to save any other paid leave. But what's unclear is how these might work with other leave laws. We'll have to watch that. Um, and then this last bullet point, the extent to which non-work is solely due to a business closure verse and or reduced hours qualifies. And we don't believe that that's going to be a sufficient basis for which an employee could take the leave, but the regulations may further illuminate the mm -hmm. circumstances under which that may be uh, available. Uh, but right now, we don't think that that would, you know, that would qualify under mm -hmm. under the under the provisions that we've already discussed with you. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. To just touch briefly, briefly on the the House bill and some of the developments that we've been alluding to that are happening today. Yeah, and I'm not going to spend much time on this because I know we want to get to a couple of questions, but I just want to give you a quick heads up uh, about what else is going on out there. You may have read that there is another bill uh, in Congress pending right now, the Take Responsibility for Workers and Families Act, and it's massive. It goes on for 800, 900 ish pages. But buried in it are some changes to the very thing we just talked about, as if, as if the House and Senate hadn't created enough chaos. Uh, they want to add to it by moving things on the fly, potentially uh, one week later. Uh, but that's essentially what's happening. Uh, I will tell you the House bill that we saw uh, was a lot more aggressive on this. The Senate bill that I saw literally a half an hour before we went to press here on the webinar uh, was more uh, limited. But in the House bill, they took out the 500 employee cap, uh, uh, which uh, for FMLA leave, they didn't do that for sick leave. Uh, it basically would cover employers regardless of size, and they tried to strip out the 50 employee exception for small businesses. Uh, the other thing that was in the House bill, again, not the Senate bill, but the House bill, is they expanded FMLA beyond the child care leave to pick up quarantine and self-quarantine recommendations. Uh, or orders, uh, which I thought was interesting language, to care for a family member who was quarantined or to care for a family member who is an individual with a disability or a senior citizen whose place of care or direct care provider is unavailable. Again, much different than what we talked about today. In the Senate version, 
that was up, uh, uh, literally up for an hour ago. Uh, that was not the case. The, in the Senate version, this 500 limit that we have right now uh, still was there. They, they did not strip it out. Uh, the same thing goes for the small business exception. Likewise, they did not ex they did not expand the FMLA triggers. They tweaked some other language around the edges in the act, but it wasn't anything nearly as substantial as what we're seeing here. Uh, uh, the the other thing that um, uh, they did, at least in the House bill, is they expanded the paid sick leave provision to slightly to again sort of modify that quarantine and self quarantine language. Uh, I don't want to scare you all because none of this may happen, right? And this is the hard thing about doing uh, discussions on things that seem to be shifting as we speak. Uh, but I will say that it's just something we all need to pay attention to. Certainly, to the extent that there are changes, uh, Peter, myself, others on our team uh, will get back to you and let you know. We don't think the changes are going to be as extensive as what I just outlined here, uh, but we'll see. Uh, as we as we speak, things may be changing uh, at this very moment. Uh, uh, speaking of changes, there are some resources available. I'm sure there will be more later, but we have copies to the link to the full act uh, as it was enacted last week, uh, the current DOL summary, plus links to the IRS news release that had the good uh, guidance that we mentioned earlier. Uh, if you uh, need help with any of that or have trouble accessing those materials, uh, please let me or Peter know or anybody else on our labor and employment team. Um, so with that, I think we have a couple of moments for questions. I know we're about out of time. We're trying to be respectful for that. Uh, Peter, you want to start off with a question that you've seen, or you want me to start off? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Brian. Um, one of the first um, questions and one of the issues that we've been seeing something, a lot of, a lot of concern from clients about is how do, you, how do you make inquiries with an employee to determine their eligibility for leave? How far can you go how much um, how much information can you gather you know typically with an FMLA request there's a process certification etc that uh, employers are very used to and we don't see that quite yet I've had a couple of clients um, draft uh, sample sample policies etc but from my standpoint and what I would suggest is that as we're waiting for the regulations to come out it is appropriate and and I think reasonable for you to to ask employees questions that relate to the specific leave request, whether it's sick leave or whether it's the new FMLA leave. Um, I don't think at this point you want to use the normal FMLA certification forms to do that. You'll we'll probably have something to be able to use that the Department of Labor will provide to employers, but right now what we would recommend is limiting the inquiry to the leave request, sufficient support if needed to, to justify that leave request, and um, you know, making sure the employee stays in touch with the company to determine when they can return to work, circumstances regarding that leave, and then always being mindful of if a leave request could lead to regular FMLA leave that you re remember to address and provide that information to the employee so they can submit and, and get access to that leave. Brian? Yeah, Peter, I agree with that. And the, uh, you know, I think we're probably going to see some forms coming out of DOL, at least maybe a potentially a modification for the current FMLA form. Uh, there may be some form that relates to the sick leave. We don't know. Uh, one thing is clear, uh, there will be a new notice requirement that's coming out. I think we mentioned earlier from the Department of Labor, that's that new notice uh, that describes employee rights uh, was supposed to come out on the 25th, uh, which would be tomorrow. Uh, now, whether that actually comes out on the 25th or not, given the changes to the new law, uh, we'll have to see. They may table that. Uh, but once you get that, that will have to be provided to employees, similar to what you do right now under the FMLA. Uh, with respect to notice. One thing I'll mention too, uh, and I've told this to clients, I'm sure Peter has as well, you know, you're probably gonna have to be flexible on some of this. Normally under the FMLA, you know, the, the, the time period for which employees have to provide you with medical documentation and get back to you 
as opposed to leaving you on the hook, uh, you know, is fairly limited. It's fairly prescribed. Uh, but these are not normal circumstances, and doctors are stretched. Uh, a lot of people can't get to their doctor. If they're waiting for a diagnosis, they've got symptoms, and you're waiting a lot of times. Unless symptoms are far enough advanced, doctors won't even see you. So you can't get a doctor's note, even if you wanted one. Um, so I think people are just going to have to be thoughtful about this. I think at a minimum, what you can do is you can ask uh, employees to submit, at least for the time being, a short email or summary to you confirming the reason for their request. And, and, and for the time being, I think we're just going to have to be flexible about whether any other supporting documentation should be provided. Uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, one other quick question, uh, and then we'll end. And this is a this is a hard question, so we'll we'll try and get summarize it as, as best we can. But it's how does a layoff or furlough impact the new leave under either the family medical leave or sick leave provisions? Um, and I think this is hard. I'll let Peter chime in as well. Uh, let's take layoff first. If it's a true risk, I'm being terminated now for lack of work. I think technically you're not covered by the act because you're not available to, quote, work because of the leave. You're out because of the business closure. But I will tell you, I've seen all sorts of different interpretations on this, and it'll be interesting to see what the DOL says. You know, I think what you worry about factually is if somebody, a plaintiff's lawyer or otherwise, tries to claim that the RIF was intended not for business reasons but to circumvent the rights under the Act, somebody might try and buttonhole a claim through this new statute. And we worry about that a little bit. But I think technically a true straight up termination, a RIF, where I'm no longer on the payroll, I'm out of coverage of the act. Furloughs are a little different though. Furloughs, technically, you're still technically on the inactive payroll. I'm not working, I'm not getting paid, but I'm still sort of on the payroll. I'm still an employee uh, and I'm still receiving benefits, for example. In, in furlough circumstances, uh, I think that's a lot harder question, right? You know, I, again, if I'm furloughed because of the business closure, et cetera, but I also have these other issues that might get triggered. If I'm, while I'm furloughed or before I'm furloughed, I have COVID and I'm, and I'm home sick because of it. Am I covered by the new act? It's hard to know. You know, I think, you know, normally under normal circumstances from a statutory construction standpoint, we might argue no, if the reason you're home again is because of the furlough. But given the fact that Congress probably intended this act to be pretty broad, I think there's some risk that uh, those individuals might, in fact, be covered. We'll just have to see what the regulations yeah, I, say. Peter, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree, Brian. I think I think that that's the right approach for it. I I could see. You know, really, the furlough is the I think the harder question. Um, is it possible on a on a layoff uh, that someone might try to put together an interference claim, and and that's certainly uh, uh, possible. I think the furlough question is going to be harder. Um, but you know, normal analysis would say, well, if if you're on furlough, you're not being paid. Um, you're on the payroll, but not otherwise accessing any of the company's policies, et cetera, um, you know, maybe not. But it, with the with the intent that Congress has expressed um, with respect to this act, um, we could see, uh, you know, we could see some uh, attempts to try to get furloughed employees the paid leave. Um, it, it's been a pretty common question. Um, and so, to the extent that they uh, do get regulations out on it, um, I would I would think we will see some indication of how that's to be treated because uh, there is a lot of conversation about furloughs and how furloughs can be can be done and and their impact um, on uh, on employees as companies go through significant revenue declines to try to get to you know. A, a economy that's starting to return uh, back to more normal, and and furloughs are a common way to try to save money mm -hmm. short term and still maintain continuity of of the workforce. Yeah, th thanks, Peter. I agree. Um, well, folks, I know we're out of time, and we're, we want to be respectful from of that. We know that there are a lot of questions that we did not get to looking at the Q and A 
box just a moment ago, I saw uh, uh, 80 plus. Uh, we will try and get back to you individually about that offline. Uh, we know this is important and we know a lot of people have questions and we will certainly uh, do our best to get back to you and circle back. Uh, understanding, of course, that we're all sort of scrambling and I know you are. Uh, speaking of which, just know that you have help if you need it. Uh, uh, I think everybody is in triage mode right now. I know Peter and I are, but we have a large team of people across our firm, uh, across all our offices in the United States and abroad, uh, who are helping on this. Uh, if you want to see sort of who's available and the different kind of level of resources that we have, everything from corporate to tax uh, to uh, M&A uh, to sort of uh, employee benefits to you name it, we have all sorts of subspecialties. Uh, both industry-wide and otherwise, that you can find on our COVID response team link. Uh, feel free to reach out to any of us uh, for help on that. Likewise, we're publishing on this, it seems, goodness, almost every hour. Uh, again, it's because the law seems to be changing every hour. You're probably getting sick of our emails and alerts. Uh, if you're not getting those, you can uh, use the link to sort of sign up for that. Likewise, there is a link, a live link on our website that's also provided here. Where, where it lists all of our different COVID resources, not just for labor and employment, but across the disciplines. Uh, feel free to access that. Uh, I think we're all doing our best to sort of keep up. Uh, we're definitely here to help, uh, and we hope you're doing well, uh, and you hope your employees are doing well. And if you need anything from Peter and me, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. Peter, anything else you want to add? Or no, that's it. We we hope all, you all are are staying safe and staying well. And um, if there's anything we can do, please let us know. And, and thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Take care.